Our scripture reading this morning comes from the love letter, book of John. It's in uh, chapter 8 that we're going to read from, and I'm going to read maybe a little bit here and there. Let's, let's start with verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placed here in the midst said to them, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And then as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up to her and said, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you open our eyes, open our ears, that we might clearly see and clearly hear what you would have us learn from just such a text. And Lord, if you will, open our hearts and make yourself a home. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So much in the text. Where do you begin? We are in a series focused on devoting our lives to what our focus is on. And when I say, I say it that way, kind of awkward on purpose. Because oftentimes, we become devoted to whatever is in front of us. It's called the tyranny of the urgent. We, we become focused on whatever is important right in front of me, rather than being devoted to the one who gives you life the one who gives you abundant life, the one who calls you brother, sister, who takes you to be with his father. So if we're going to be devoted to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and understand what it means to have his spirit live within us, we're taking time to understand really who Jesus is. The seven I am statements seem to make sense. Today we're looking at Jesus making the claim, I am the light of the world. Big claim, big deal. Light is a natural agent, is defined, that stimulates sight and makes things visible. Yeah, that might be Webster that's giving us a definition, but I want us to be thinking about Jesus when we think about this definition. Because wouldn't that be pretty accurate? Understanding of a problem or an enlightenment of what it is you're dealing with on a daily basis. Are you hearing Jesus? The verb use is, is to provide with light or lighting, illuminate, bring things to light. Chris, photography is made up of two distinct words. As you, some of you may know, I spend a lot of time thinking and praying as I walk throughout the world thinking about photography. One of the number one things that is important in photography is light. I've never seen a picture, well, maybe I have, of, of pitch black. It's all about the light, how the light is cast, how the light is captured on the simplest of things. Photography is two words that are brought together. Photo meaning light and graph meaning data, meaning the information that is brought in, that is presented. Every photographer will do all kinds of things to master the use of a camera to adjust it just so, allow certain light to come in, allow a shutter speed to be so fast in order to capture light at night, for example. In order to capture it during the day, it's got to be a little bit different. Sunlight at different times of day, as you know, 
will be different times where photographers will look for a certain special kind of light. Late in the day, early morning, the sun is low on the horizon, shines through the horizon, and gives you a golden glow. It's called the golden hour. After sun sets in the evening that we have pictures of Tampa, um, you will see what's called the, the blue hour. The sky seems to turn blue because the light is captured so, so differently. Low light is a beautiful time, and I, I really enjoy low light. But it's really the light that, that lies and in, in lights on people. When you capture the right person in the, the right light and see them in a little bit of a different way, the beauty comes out in what the Lord says, what the Lord is showing you, what the Lord is showing you about what's important to that person. Light, though, whenever taking a photograph, it's important to understand that it's not a really good idea to photograph the source of light. Seems obvious, doesn't it? I mean, taking pictures of the sun doesn't provide very wonderful photos. But what you do is you take a look at a simple scene, a simple beach with the clouds that come off beautiful. You are capturing the reflection of a source of light. This reflection comes out and the beauty is illuminated. Apart from that, it's nothing. Apart from that, you don't see anything. We've been all taught to think that the sun is the source of all light. The sun is amazing. The sun is gigantic. It's all true. Consider this. The sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. If a baby were to start flying to the sun at birth, traveling 150 miles an hour, this sounds like an SAT question, traveling 150 miles an hour, this baby would be nearly 71 years old by the time it got there. That's how far away that light is. It puts off an energy of 70,000 horsepower per square yard per minute. All I know is that's a lot. And the temperature on the sun's surface is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about the same as a Florida summer afternoon. Okay, so we're on the same page. Too often, we feel that the sun is the source of light. When Scripture teaches us that that isn't the case at all. Before there was the sun, there was the sun. I'm playing with words there a little bit. In the beginning, it says in Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that light was good, and God separated light from the darkness. God, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, there was morning, the first light. God so loved the world that the first thing that he did was illuminated so you could see and appreciate it. God loved the world so much that he made sure that anything that was created could be seen. Fast forward. In the beginning was the Word from John 1. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son why? That the world might see the world for what it truly is. That's what we're talking about today. Jesus is the light of the world that shines on the goodness on all. And the world isn't so much what we've made it, although we think it is. But it is the light that God shines. Jesus made comments. He made some hard comments. I was talking with our youth director before, our children's director before the service, that there are times that I read in Scripture things that I really wish God wouldn't have said. There are times that we see that the Pharisees even say the same thing. Pharisees are those that are the, the religious zealots, those that, that have studied and studied everything that has been given to them, and they come to understand you know, the way of the world, the way that God works, how God came to be, and so on and so forth. 
Jesus made some statements that made these guys' beards uh, straighten out if they were curly. He made their socks rolling up and down if they were ones that wore socks with their sandals. Jesus made some comments to say that I am. Just to say those words were remarkably, it, it, it would blow the minds of a Pharisee. Because those are the words that describe God. That we see in Exodus 3.14, we, we read about that last week. Moses is going along with God and says, who am I supposed to say sent me with these ideas that you want him to follow, these commandments? And, and tell him I am who I am. Say that to Israel. Let them know, Israel, that's, that's who sent you. So for Jesus to say, I am, he's making a bold statement. I am God. I am the light of the world. Light for the Jewish person was the ultimate ideal, a representation of salvation, of knowledge, of goodness. It was a big deal. They had festivals to celebrate light. It was an important thing. And Jesus is here saying, I am that light with which you celebrate. Those who follow Christ in truth, must they may stumble in darkness, as our scripture read, but they will never perpetually walk in it. And that's what Jesus is trying to help us to understand. Follow me, and I can be your light. I can light your path. We think of light when we think of the sun, but we need to think of the other sun. Because clearly we know we live in a dark world. I don't need to talk about how bad the world is isn't that. I think of the world as a world that's maybe just a little confused or a little bit like in a wilderness. And Jesus is saying, I can light your path if only the world would turn to it. Jesus made these claims about himself. Here, this being the the second I am statement, We, we looked at the first last week, the second I am statement in that he is basically saying what David wrote about in the psalm that he is, he is the God. In Psalm 27, 1, it says, The Lord is my light, my salvation. Jesus claiming to be the light is claiming to be that Lord and that salvation. But it also says in Isaiah, the prophet wrote, The sun shall be no more, shall no more be your light by day, nor, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will give you everlasting light. Again, minds explode when Jesus claims that he is God. But Jesus isn't just calling himself a light. Jesus is calling himself the light. The one and only light. The one and only God, not a God. The one and only who comes. Jesus' claim for his followers were were tremendous. Whoever follows me won't walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. To me, it's interesting that the text that, 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 that precedes this, this John 8, 12, which is where Jesus says, I am the light, is a story about a woman caught in adultery. It's interesting to me that this is the example that is used for representing the light of the world. But think about that text for a moment. Think about the audacities that, that happened to bring this woman before Jesus in the first place. Now, I don't want to get into details, but last time I checked, adultery was with two people. Yet we're reading about the woman who was brought before, who was brought before by authorities. She's following them and listening to what they say, and she's she's brought forward. And we need to follow the law and take care of this. Jesus made a statement that I really want us to pay attention to. He who is without sin cast the first stone. Well, they all walked away because they had sinned. But who was still sitting there? The Lamb of God? The one who had committed no sin? The one to whom there was nothing to be found that was was sinful? He was without sin. And what did he say to her? He said, go ahead and go, woman. I'm not not going to condemn you. Go. But stop doing that action. Change your path. 
do things a little bit different. What does this have to do with light? This has everything to do with shining on a difficult situation that someone felt was important and they judged this person to be wrong and Jesus shines light on that to say, hey, there's something else going on here. You can't claim that someone is doing something wrong if you're doing it wrong yourself. You can't hold this person accountable if you don't hold yourself accountable. We have this going on in our world today in a remarkable fashion. I am sorry for the politicians that I know that have to, sorry, Gail, that, that have to deal with the, this idea of you've done this, you're that, you're not this, you're not that, and none of it points the fingers back. My friend says when you point one finger forward, you have three or four pointing back at you, but that's never the case. This text is pointing towards that. The moment that I judge someone for what they are doing and suggest that they're doing it wrong, Maybe I've forgotten what we start our service with. Maybe I have forgotten my confession. Maybe I have forgotten that I need to lay my sins at the cross if I'm going to call out this person's and put them there also. See, because even the Pharisees, they called Jesus out. They said, you know, okay, you've said these things, but let me keep on reading for us. The Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true because they knew the scriptures would say there's no way that anyone would bear witness about themselves. There will be the one who will come in the wilderness that will bear witness. They knew that part of the text. They had missed on John the Baptist. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, even then my testimony is true for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true for it is alone. It is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. Jesus is making the statement he has every ability to judge this woman for what she's done wrong. He's called her out for something that she has done wrong. But Jesus has also shown us that even in our darkest moments, even with the things that we carry on the backs, the things that we can't seem to step aside, the identities that we give ourselves that we can't seem to forget, Jesus says there is forgiveness for even that. Even if what you think about yourself is true, that too can be laid at the foot of the cross. That too can be set aside to help you recognize you are made in God's image. You are made for a specific purpose. You are not perfect. But I am. Jesus says, I am. Because I will shine the light on you to help you to understand who you really are in God's eyes. This is what he is saying to this woman. There's only one thing that you need when you're walking in dark. And that's light. It's amazing to me how these Pharisees, these religious zealot type people, were so into what they knew, were so into what they were about, that Jesus shared with them about the law, about how he is from God. They don't know his father. And their answer is, they said to him, where is your father? Almost to the extent of, you know, okay, prove it, prove it. Prove who you are. Prove where you're at. They just didn't get it, maybe because they didn't want to. Maybe it is a lot of us that we want to hold on to what we know, what we have learned. They call that experience. Experience is a good thing. We have all experienced a great deal of life in this room. It has brought us to where we are. The question I have for you is, are the bad things or the difficult things what is going to define how you treat the future? Or is it who God shines light on you and who says you are and who knows you for who you are, who forgives you and loves you as a child of God? Is that the light 
that will illuminate the future for you. We come here on Sundays. We come here for Bible studies. We come here to understand the love of Christ, and that's a great thing. But the question I have for you is why? Why do that? And I have to believe that the answer for each of us here is because I want to understand to help me to know as I walk into an unknown future that God is actually with me. Too often, it's easy for us to say, well, God clearly loves that person over there more than me. Do you see what happened in that person's life? That's a great thing. I see blessings in that person all the time. Then why am I in a rut? Why am I in a dark space? Why do I have difficulties going on? Friends, the wrong things are being illuminated in that statement. Jesus, through his spirit working in us, living in us, shining through us, wants to illuminate in your life what God has set out for you. We talked about it in the photography. We too often think that we are the light that shines on whatever situation we deal with. When we need to understand, we're not the source of the light. It's the Spirit who lives through us. It's the love that flows through us. Light and love go hand in hand. They're one and the same. One drives the other. When we come and allow the light to shine on us, we can understand more and more the light of God. Chris? I'm going to miss you when you go. I'll miss you too, Ron. But you're wrong if you think that the joy of life comes principally from human relationships. God's placed it all around us. It's in everything, in anything we can experience. People just need to change the way they look at those things. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take stock of that. No, I am. I am. But I want to tell you something. From the bits and pieces I put together, you know from what you told me about your family, your mother and your dad. And I know you got your problems with the church too. But there's some kind of bigger thing we can all appreciate. And it sounds like you don't mind calling it God. When you forgive, you love. And when you love, God's light shines on you. When you forgive, you love. And when you love, God's light shines on you. When you forgive yourself, you love. When you forgive your neighbor, you love. When you forgive those who try to persecute you, you love. And it is that reflection of where that love first came from that is expressed. And that is the light that shines on the scenario for God's work being done in and around and through you and me. God wants to love the world through you, through me. And for someone here today, you need to learn what that forgiveness means 
when you forgive yourself first. When you learn to love yourself first. For who you are. Not who you think you've become. This older gentleman has gone through a life of life. A long time of dealing with life. He's sharing with this young man who is very faithful, but he has a real problem with the church. And he's sharing with them, boiling down the gospel very, very simply. If you forgive, you love. If you love, the light will shine upon you. He didn't say much about judgment or anything. He didn't say much about following a law or anything. But friends, if we are to understand Jesus as being the light of the world, we've got to understand what that means and why he came. And that is the gospel. And that is that he calls us to love the Lord your God, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love neighbor as self. And that requires us to begin that process of loving self so that we can love neighbor, so that we can understand the light that shines on us loving God with all that we got. You can't do that, that halfway. It's not a solution that can work halfway. We live in a dark world. It just, it just is. And I'm not talking about the sun's light. We live in a dark world. It just is. Jesus is the light that leads us to the Father, but also leads us to the abundant life today, the life filled with love. Whoever follows Jesus will not walk in darkness always, but will have the light of life. True belief is to follow our Lord and Savior. Does Jesus lead your steps? Does your life submit to God's will? Or is it an occasional thing? What does the world see in your what does the world see in your reflection? Is God's light being reflected on the darkness in Martin County through us? Through other Christians? I sure hope so. And if not, I love that, I, that a God loves me enough to say, David, if you're not getting it right, I'll give you a second chance. Come to me. Lay that issue at the cross. Come to me and all right, all right, you, you, you did those things, whatever. Come to me and let's love the world together. Let me let my light shine through you that it might be illuminated by all that you do and all that you are and all that you love. I love our Lord, I love the God of second chances. Friends, that's what light is. A chance to see again. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you so much that you illuminate the, the silliness that we have in our lives. You illuminate the things that we think must keep us from you, must keep us from your love must keep us from the understanding that you want us to have about who we are. Lord, we thank you for this text. We thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much that we are not responsible for other people. But we are responsible for ourselves. Lord, come into our hearts with your spirit as promised. Again, and make yourself a home. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't
don't want to worship any more of these things. Search me. Oh God, and know my heart, and know my anxious thoughts. If there's any offensive way in me, in the way of everlasting. Oh God, and know my heart, and know my anxious thoughts. If there's any offensive I don't want to chase any more of these dreams. Don't want to walk away any more from your love. I don't want to live any more for this world. Don't want to find my strength anymore in myself. I don't want to spill any more of your blood. Don't want to be ashamed any more of your name. I just want to lay all my crowns at your feet. I just want to raise up my hands. 